Yeah. Or whatever. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah. We've been here. The, uh, the deities of the Menlo are very active nowadays. And it's very magical here. I'm almost done to you. Almost finished with Columbia and I'll be here all the time. You know, it would suck. Except for occasional visits to Boulder. <laughs> That's an idea. Yeah, there are a lot of beautiful uh, mortis yeah. all around. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we got a bunch of things in Bali. And the ship just arrived. That's it for you. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. So, for this, you have to sit straight to do this. Because coming, you know? it's an invitation to Ganesha to sit down. Uh, in the sacred seat. And being yogis and yoginis, we travel light and our sacred seats and our temples are inside. And so your pelvic basin is the sacred seat. And you're inviting this rather rotund uh, comedian uh, to sit down in your sacred seat. And if he takes you up, which is on it, it's is very likely it's going to really change your posture. So, okay. so you got to sit straight just for your own uh, survival when you chant this. Okay. Ramana, 
So that's supposed to take care of all the obstacles that tend to arise. <laughs> oh, I forgot to put the Philippine off because it's a hard switch. Oh. I have to add that tomorrow. Okay. That's it, yeah. And I think one of the, the ways that is considered a, a remover, Ganapati as a remover of obstacles, mm -hmm. is he actually sits in front, in, fr in the path, in front of you know whatever you're desired mm -hmm. object is mm -hmm. as the actual situation. Mm -hmm. And you have to realize that like, Ganapati is the obstacle. Mm -hmm. And that Ganapati is actually the goal. Mm -hmm. And so you're, oh, and you basically go, oh, I get it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's fine. So if you're ever experiencing an obstacle, it's actually Ganapati. Shall we read one verse of the Kalachakra? Yeah. I read this, uh, I recently retranslated the beginning of, we, we have translated our group, four out of five of the Kalachakra chapters. And I recently started working on the first chapter. And in the first chapter, uh, there's a long uh, preface by, uh, a long preface by uh, Undarika, which means white lotus which was the eighth king of Shambhala. And he was the reincarnation of Avalokiteshvara, supposedly. And his father was someone called Yashat, Manjushri Yashat, meaning famous, Manjushri famous, believed to be a reincarnation of Manjushri. And the story is that the uh, Brahmins in uh, Shambhala, there were apparently a caste system and there were Brahmins there. And they got tired of him and of Shambhala, which is the model for Shangri-La. It's supposed to be a really cool place. Somewhere in the north, nobody knows where it is. It's a magic land, in a mystical, a mysterious land. And uh, so they said to Yashat, they said, I'm sorry, your Kalachakra Tantra is too complicated for us. We're sick and tired of it. We're going back to India to do our Vedas and forget about you. So he said, OK, fine, you guys take off. See you later. And then they all went out, and it was a tremendous problem getting across the desert and the mountains and the rivers, you know, I think coming from Siberia, the North Pole, nobody knows where Shambhala is actually, but it's north of Mongolia, whatever that means, supposedly. And um, in, in beyond Siberia or somewhere else, yeah. And um, then they all, then they, of course, Manjushri, uh, he pulled a trick on them, and it wasn't nice. And he sent some sort of a demon out there and they made a big noise and they were out in the middle of the desert, they were lost anyway, and then the steamer made a big noise, and then the, they all passed out. So when they had passed out, he somehow had somebody who, who had miraculous ability to bring them back, all back. And then they, when they woke up, they were back in, in Shambhala. <laughs> they come down. So then uh, he said, look, I'm sorry about it. We're going to uh, simplify the tantra, and I'm going to write a short version, a light. I'm going to write Kalachakra light. I love you, Kalachakra. He did. And then he says, and that'll make it hard for you to understand it. So my son, the eighth king, I'm telling him he has to write a commentary called Vimala Prabha, the stainless light. And um, uh, 
and then he wrote the simplified one, and then he initiated them all again, and then he, well, he did a very strange thing, which was in the initiation, he made them, was when you initiated, you become brother and sister with everyone else who gets initiated. So he said, now you're all initiated in this new version that I made for you. So now you're all equal, you're all brother and sister, so there's no more caste. So everyone is one caste, everyone is of the Vajra caste. Vajra means, you know, diamond, it can, in the old days in Indra's time, Vajra meant a thunderbolt, it was like a weapon. But in the Buddhist tantras and in Mahayana Buddhism, it comes to mean like the unbreakable, clear light of the void, ultimate nature of reality, infinite energy that, that lies at the base of all matter and mind. Clearly, you've heard of the clear light of the void, I presume everyone has. And that's not true because nothing can break it because it's infinite energy. It's also very lazy because being infinite energy, anything, everything's already done. So it doesn't do anything by itself. It's just peaceful. But it can be drawn on by ignorant people who think they need to do something. To busy people like me. And successively busy people. And then it can in infinitely be drawn on. So anyway, there they were, these Brahmins. And they kind of decided to get into it, you know. That their sweeper, former sweeper, was the same Vajra caste as their brother and their sister. It's a little, I think, harsh for them at the beginning. So then after that, the, the next 25 kings of Shambhala, beginning with the eighth Pundarika, are called Kalki kings, like the 10th incarnation of Vishnu. Uh, Kalki, and what Kalki means is actually it's like a contraction of Kulika means one who upholds the caste. And, but it doesn't mean who reestablishes the caste system. It means who upholds the caste, the Vajra caste of everybody. So I'm very, mm -hmm. I annoy my colleagues in Buddhist studies because I translated Kalki King as a democratic king. Because democracy is based on the idea that everyone's equal. Ultimately, I mean, not actually, but ultimately they are, right? Okay, so then he wrote this thing, this Pundarika. And when I, when I, I love Pundarika, when I translate him, I feel I'm hearing His Holiness. You know, he is the Dalai Lama. He is also supposed to be the Avalokiteshvara. Right? Mm -hmm. And then he had a, usually the Dalai Lamas or the Pendulum Lamas in Tibet, once in a lifetime or possibly twice, they would do a public conferral of the Kala Chakra, a grand initiation, you know. And this guy, is done, he's up at number 34, I think, or 35. He's like, he quit at 30, but now he's up to 34 or 5, because people keep bugging him. And uh, there's another one in January. And anyway, he, because the Vishvamata, who is the, which means the universal mother, who is the female form of Kala Chakra, she, he had a vision of her in the early 60s, that when he first escaped to India, that he should promote the Kala Chakra worldwide, you know, that it would be very important for world peace to do so, and that he, he could give it many initiations to anybody and so on that he wanted. And uh, so he did that. So he did all these things, and he trained the, the monks of his personal monastery to be really experts in all the art of the Kala Chakra and the whole thing. And in the thing I sent you, you'll see the mandala. Some of you probably have already seen it, but many of you will have, but others can see that. Anyway, it's been the first great summary, which destroys all devils and obstructors, the precepts on the supreme archetype deity and the noble path. That's the name of the... The, the first chapter is divided in four or five. Mahabudesha, therefore, great summaries. And it begins, I bow, bow to Mandunaga, I bow to Sri Kala Chakra. I, I, do, I do have the Sanskrit somewhere else, but we don't need to chatter. I bow to the glorious Kala Chakra, the very soul of voidness and compassion, embodying in one both knower and known of the triniversal world, free of birth or death. I got tired of saying triple universe, so I call it triniverse. <laughs> what is this problem? Why do we need to say triple universe? Who, who asked that? No. It's a triniverse. <laughs> triniverse. Yeah, triniverse. Triniverse. Right? Triniverse. So triniverse, at this, at, this, at this point I was compromising to say triuniversal, I did. But now I go triniversal, forget the U. <laughs> <laughs> I salute that one embraced by divine lady wisdom, she formless, still manifesting form, whose immutable bliss, free of birth and death, is beyond the pleasures of the comic, etc., moods, you know, the nine <coughs> gathas, 
or the eighty process, you know, the karmic, tragic, etc. Who is father of Buddhas, combining all three bodies, knower of all three times, therefore omniscient, that very non-dual, supreme, primal Buddha, divine. So that's that's uh, that's a salutation to Karataka. Ganesha is, by the way, Ganesha not only is Ganesha in the Kavataka Mandala, but Mrs. Ganesha is in there. There is a Mrs. Ganesha. Seriously, there is. And she's in the Kavataka Mandala. And in the speech mandala, in the body mandala, they're in the union, in the center of a, chak of a wheel, with their 12 body mandala wheels that correspond to the 12 months. And they are in the center of one of them, which I don't remember which one, it's the old hand. And he's the big Ganesha, and Mrs. Ganesha is in union, you know, sort of wrapped around him. But in the speech mandala, Mrs. Ganesha is macho and big. They, you know, they duplicate their bodies, no problem. So she's in the speech mandala, there's eight chakras there, and she and he are in the center of one of them. And, and she is a big macho, you know, breasty elephant, red <laughs> elephant. And he's a little guy wrapped around too. Some <laughs> serious yoga there. Is he a little <laughs> Well, yeah, he has an open head, but yeah. you know, he has a human humanoid body oh, and great. I guess the equipment down there. <laughs> and, but he's smaller. So my friend who passed away, sadly, one of my students and one of the great artist monks who made the thing for the monks of Dalai Lama's thing to paint on the wall all these individual deities, the seven hundred and twenty two individual deities of the Karataka Mandala. Oh. When they did the speech mandala, they couldn't dig, they couldn't get a big woman and a little guy kind of wrapped around, you know, like a comp sort. They couldn't quite get that. Well, they couldn't even so, so they put the breast on the guy, sort of like, you know, from the side, you know, the like, breast was like that. And he was so mad. He was up there erasing them. And, you know, they, they thought it was the male, male gender. There's a Mrs. Indra, Mrs. Brahma, Mrs. Mrs. Oh, Mrs. Rudra. They're all female in the speech mandala. The women are dominating there in the speech yeah, mandala. Really. You know, yeah. 64 Vedic goddesses are there around them in the, in the eight wheels in the, six, in the, the pedals of the eight wheels. Yeah. Anyway, I know that's a digression, but I thought it was fun. <laughs> yeah, so speech or Vak. What? Vak. Yes. Speech yes. Is the, uh, the, the creative. Principle, yes. language. Yes. And so, and that's always considered uh, the feminine. Yes. In the in the in the in the Guru Samaja Tantra, there's a famous verse that says, "Your body follows your mind, but your mind follows your speech." So you know, mantra creates the universe. That's the you know, old Vedic yeah. idea. Too. Yeah. So speech is like the speech is everybody's mind. You know, through speech we have a collective mind. Right. That's a special human thing. I think the gods also talk. They talk, although they don't have to use words sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. Right. But they're too lazy. They're an endless massage. <laughs> <laughs> Eternal massage. So, um, you know, I, Bali was fun because the Shaivites and the Vajracharyas, you know, the Tantrakas from Shiva, and the Vajracharyas are supposed to be mutually present with the king whenever they do a serious ritual. So they have a very, they still have what I think ancient India had, it's a very friendly relationship. You know, there's some philosophical arguments, of course, what goes on, but that goes on among the Buddhists and among the Hindus with each other as well. But there wasn't this big gulf that you feel in India nowadays. And it was, uh, and Bali some has a little, Nepal a little bit has that feeling, and, and Isn't that true? Bali very much so. Southeast Asia in general, like, like I know in, in Thailand, they, you know, Dominantly, you know, a Buddhist culture, but they yeah. used, you know, the, the Brahman influence. It was just sure. And all the rituals they would use Brahman. They did, but well, up until the fourteenth, I think, or fifteenth century, yeah. uh, most of the Southeast Asian countries had Mahayana and Vajrayana, and therefore they were they that got along with the Brahmins and the royal rituals. But then the, later, there's some stuff happened, and then the. Sri Lankan came in with a sort of very rigid Theravada thing that makes them very nervous. Like if you give a talk in Bangkok, in like Buddha Dasa Archive or something, one of the sort of most liberal places, and you talk Mahayana, they kind of think it's fun. But you mention Tantrayana and the monks take a hike. Yeah. <laughs> they do, and they like say, oh, excuse me, you know, that 
afraid some female might come to get them or something. <laughs> so seriously, it's a problem. <laughs> and, uh, and but they're beginning, like we had here just now with this doctor, we had a young Thai guy who really wanted to study Mandriana and Maya and stuff, and he was saying that there's a movement and he's going to be part of it, blah, 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 and he's going to be kill out. But the monks are still pretty terrible, you know, the Sri Lanka kind of orthodoxy. Sri Lanka itself had Mandriana and, uh, and Maya. Before, up to the 10th, 11th century. So it all got wiped out. So it makes them too peaceful. You know? Had to get conquered. Yeah. Yeah, that's true also in North India too. Sorry? I mean, in, in India. Yes. In India. Yeah. What happened? They got steamrolled. Well, they got steamrolled by a bunch of Tajiks and yeah. Uzbeks and Iranians and not, not really the Arabs. The Arabs were there a long time before, were trading with boats and things. Oh, no, yeah. But the actual land invasions were were, in the were newly, mostly newly converted to Islam and therefore unified by Islam. And therefore, uh, tribal sort of Turkic types, you know, Tajik, Uzbek, Hazaras, people like that, yeah. Pashtuns, you know, yeah. the, the, the famous Pashtuns. So because Islam made them tribal fighting, instead of fighting each other, they got unified and they conquered everything. Yeah. You know, sorry if you know. So there's new, newly converted people are more dangerous. Pretty much, yeah. And of course, the wealth, of, not only of the Buddhism, but the Hindu temples and the Buddhist things, like that I was just reading about the Chinese guy, was just unbelievable. You know, the giant golden Shivas and Vishnus and Buddhas and female Buddhas and you know, really gold and gold, encrusted with jewels and huge golden stupa. Like, it's incredible the wealth, of, you know, that attracted people to India. Yeah. It's amazing. And so, and that I think Babar and these um, these conquerors, they would, they, they, there are Muslim records that add up the metric tons of jewels and gold and stuff that they would take out of the temples, Hindu temples too. They destroyed thousands of them. But they couldn't destroy Hinduism because they couldn't destroy the villages because they needed the people to work in the villages and then the caste system was convenient to keep them from rebelling. And, but the Buddhist monasteries, they totally destroyed, burned all the books and the monks. And uh, that, so that's a big change. You know? But luckily, the knowledge had fled up into Tibet. So really, like, uh, I'm a very, you know, a very devoted to Dalai Lama, and Dalai Lama always says, he is the son of Nalanda. Do you all know what Nalanda is? Nalanda was the great Indian university of the first millennium, even beginning before in the BCE centuries, uh, which core faculty were mostly Buddhist monks, but they were, and a lot of them were from the Brahman or Kshatriya class, of course, themselves. And then also Brahmins studied there, and they had medical schools, and they had architectural schools, and they had you know, drama schools and poetry schools. I mean, it was not just the Dharma. It was all different kinds of sciences and things like it was like the Oxford or Harvard or something of the time for a thousand years, and it was completely burned down in 1172 by Bhaktiar, a guy called Bhaktiar, and uh, all the well, amazing temples, all the gold and everything were taken. They burned all the books. The books burned for six months or something. But luckily, thousands of them were translated into Tibetan, and that's what we we're trying to do. This one did survive in Sanskrit. Uh, the uh, the uh, Kala Chakra. And maybe I'll try to get some of the verses out of the scan that I have of the Kala Chakra text. So you can chant that or we can read that later. I have 21 verses here that will slowly work up and explain in the session sessions what the, all this means. You know. They have this odd idea that the Lady Wisdom, uh, I, I'm mistranslating here, I should have said, immaterial yet manifesting matter. The, that uh, the Mrs. Kalachakra, whose name is Vishwamata, that she, her body has no atoms. It's not only a pure mental body, it's an energy body, but it is a level of energy where there's no atoms. The atoms are too coarse. And actually also the Kalachakra does, which is a really interesting concept. I'm very fascinated by it. You know, if you think that your, your body, do you think your body is made of atoms, for example? I was thinking about this because I've been looking into this topic. 
we, we would be told, right, by a doctor, well, you have molecules, but well, your DNA, oh, you have this bad DNA, you better, like, amputate your elbow or something. Okay, we have to grow in it. You know what I mean? So we think we have cells and molecules, and we're in meat space, right? So it's a, what they call meat space. Right? That's where we are. We're in meat space. And this is the meat, this is me. Okay, but now wait. And if you, I, I read this thing. Sir so Arthur Eddington in 1924 wrote a book in which he said, this whole world is an illusion. He said, I have two desks in my study. One is a wooden desk with the papers on it that I write. And one is uh, just a you know, visual collection of atoms. You know, and I sort of keep my thoughts on that one. Because they can't let rest, if nothing will rest on it. Because you know, the atoms are empty, right? There's a, there's a nucleus, an electron, it's really not, nothing there. Yeah. He even wrote that. That was before major quantum. Now with quantum, they're desperately down there chasing the Higgs boson. You, you, you saw that in the newspaper last summer, right? They really freaked out, the men, mostly, physicists. <laughs> And they're trying to find out why there is a sense of mass. You know, how does it happen? Because everything keeps coming apart. It totally falls apart. And then they get down to light particles, and then really weird shit happens. <laughs> Spooky action at a distance, and something spinning like mild black holes make you know things, and you can feel it a century, like light years later. I mean, it's so weird. They can't deal with it. So they want something that will give them mass of the visible spectrum of the universe, which is only 3% of the matter. The yang part is only 3%. No wonder males are as insecure. <laughs> the dark matter and dark energy is 97%, and they haven't seen it yet. Are they in control or what? Right? So this, this idea is what I'm, what I'm saying is actually we could go to the level of atoms even, and we'd be, our, our meat space hand would be mostly empty space, <laughs> with something swishing around in it. But then actually those things come apart, those electrons and those things, and finally we get to the photon, which is light, and it's moving at its own speed, so it's at that boundary where, as a particle, if it hits the, its speed, its own natural speed, mass is infinite, so it's everywhere. It's like the clear light of the void. Yeah. So each right? point is at the front. Right? Each point is the whole thing. Yeah. It's just like some of these books. The, exactly. The... So that means that we're actually made of light, yeah. too. But she is formally made of light. So, you know, they're, they're conceding that we think we're in meat space, and we're trying to get out of it or something, and we're trying to understand it or whatever. You know, we're dealing with being meat for something to devour, you know? <laughs> You know, universe to devour in death through death or you know aggression or whatever, and so that's why we're so like worried about everything. But actually, everything is actually just pure light, and somehow we've configured it through our ignorance into this, this lumpy stuff. This idea. So the idea is that she. That's what it, I said form because in the old days people translated rupa, which can mean a visual object, and that's why the translators always translated rupa as form. Because it means that rupa comes from rup to make a mark on something. So rupa, a verb, you know. So rupa means form as a visual object. But as matter itself, you know, like even invisible matter, like wind or something, that's also rupa. So that one should be translated matter. So she, immaterial, I, I was following the old thing, I should have. She, immaterial, still manifesting matter. So the idea, therefore, that Kalashakra tells us is that. Enlightenment means where you live consciously from the state of being pure light. And you could manifest her, you could manifest matter in meat space to engage with beings trapped in meat space who seeking liberation and seeking happiness. I mean, they're not seeking liberation, except they think they'll be happy. Right? Seeking happiness. Right? So, so bliss, seeking bliss. Right? Isn't that what everybody's seeking? Right? <laughs> so isn't that fun? I like that. Yeah. I'm very liking that. Nowadays. Kala Chakra itself, the name means, Kala means time, and Chakra means wheel, but it sort of means, like a wheel can be used in Sanskrit to mean a machine. But it doesn't mean a time machine like it goes around in time. 
it means that time itself becomes a machine of evolution to benefit suffering beings, is what it means. So kala is ultimate reality, time, and chakra is the relative reality of movement toward realized infinite time. So infinite time, something like that. And Ganesha is totally one with them. The thing about tantric mandalas that have many deities, the practitioner who's initiated wants to meditate themselves as the main deity, of course. But when there is a big, there's a big uh, parishat, you know, a big assembly of other deities, one is supposed to be all of them as well. Right. So you're you plus you're everybody else in the mandala. So do you have to sometimes go through and become all of the other deities? Yes. You know, just be that. Yes. And then that one. Yes. Because they all have a different quality. They're all looking from a different place. Yeah. Sort of. And so you're rehearsing when you're a Buddha, when you actually feel you are all of other beings, which must be really confusing. <laughs> I mean, imagine right now if you suddenly didn't know which person in the room you were, because you felt like you were all of them. And if one of them was having a strong sensation or a strong mental surge or something, you might sort of be located there, but you actually simultaneously felt you were in every body in the, in the room. And then you magnified that inconceivably. That's a de I mean, that's by definition, because it could be a giant hoax, actually. But I hope not. I don't think so. <laughs> but that's a, that's a, you know, and then in Vedanta you have it. Brahma is everything, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So everybody's Brahma. In the Kenao, it's fun said you're going to do that. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and only Uma knew it, though. She's the only one she told me that actually you are in Brahma. Yeah. Right? I don't want to give away this. It's a punchline. <laughs> <laughs> How come Uma is in such an early Upanishad, or is it a later Upanishad? It's a fairly early Upanishad. Really? Um, and I think nobody knows how early No. It's 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 not ch the Kena Upanishad is not chanted in Vedic I see. Swara. Right. Like Taitreya Upanishad right. is. But it can still be Way early. Right. And, uh, seems to be. Yeah. But Uma yeah. seems, you know, Uma, the Uma Shiva story seems a little later. Uma, but there must be a Vedic legend about Uma, right? The rebirth, reincarnation of Parvati. Mm -hmm. And Kali is also too long. Any questions? <laughs> you don't want to be too late tonight. Some of you are getting up at 4.30. <laughs> so, so it's not compulsory. So later on, maybe we'll say later. Uh, do you want to forge ahead into anything? Or what do you want to do? We can just look at the cover of the, of the booklet. The cover of the booklet? Yeah. Okay. Just, but not go past the cover. <laughs> okay. Because the cover says it all. All right. Please. <laughs> so the, the little Sanskrit word at the top is pratyaksha. Yes, I was wondering about that. Yeah, I just stuck that it's on there. Experiential it, perception. It means right in front of your eye. Right. And so, right against it. Or any organ. Aksha can be. Yeah, because aksha, aksha is any, any of the Hearing, organs, but it's, smell, the eye smell. always represents everything else. Right. And, and cultures. So right in front of the eye, and um, part of what happens in the Ken Upanishad is, you know, the gods who are Indra and uh, Agni and yes. Vayu yes. are very conceited. They tend to be. Yeah, they tend to be, because, you know, they're just part of your own mental structure. Uh, and, uh, you know, they thought that they were, you know, cool. And, and they didn't they, understand, you know, what was actually going on around them. They roared their lordship over the world. Yeah. And so uh, what kept appearing in front of them in the last two chapters is a little yaksha. Uh -huh. So it's like a little spirit that you might see in the forest out here. In fact, okay. keep your eyes peeled. And like an elf, elf or something. Like a little elf or something, but often very cute. <laughs> you know, like, like a little puppy or kitty cat, but, you know. Maybe flies around, and, and you have no idea 
what it is. So like yaksha and aksha. Aksha is again the eye, or is direct perception. Yeah, cool. So right, and so they were having, and so Brahman, you know, yeah. to get rid of their pride, started to appear as a little yaksha, you know? uh-huh. and uh, they would uh, wanted, they would always rush up to the yaksha, you know, to uh-huh. try to know it. You know, what are you? I want to reduce you to a concept. Uh huh. And uh, they couldn't. And so. Oh, this little yaksha, they couldn't figure out what they it could was. Not, they couldn't move it, you know, Vayu couldn't blow it away. Right. Agni couldn't burn it. In right. The, you know, well, you have to read the book. See what happens. <laughs> but, um, but there's a whole thing in the whole classical yoga thing. Of, okay. Like, Chitta Vritti Nirodha. Okay. Yoga Sutra. Chitta Vritti Nirodha, yes. Yeah. Um, the idea is that the what is arising as your experience is not what you think it is. Mm-hmm. It's what you think is puts a brit on it or a spin, mm-hmm. and you're never actually paying attention mm-hmm. to what's actually occurring in the present moment. Mm-hmm. And so, um, classical yoga is nirodha, or suspension of the britting of the chitta, mm-hmm. in which then all of a sudden what is arising is perceived, or they call it a pratyaya, or that mm-hmm. which is coming forth. Yes. And in the coming forth, uh, your mind is nirodha. It doesn't wander away. It's just like uh, you're seeing what's going on. Uh-huh. We're not allowed to tell you what's happening. Yes. <laughs> so this is right in front of you. Right. But you're not paying attention to right. what's actually happening. So this is like a to correct that mm-hmm. that unfortunate situation. Yes. Just not paying attention to things. Yes. That fits very well with the Naga, the great uh, Buddhist logician in the fifth century. And, uh, his definition of Pratyaksha. Uh-huh. That uh, it's something that is without concept. Yeah. He he uh, <coughs> but anyway, I don't want to get away from that. I want to stay here right in front of us. So he's here uh, Ganesha is there in this lotus, four mm-hmm. petal lotus, mm-hmm. above your head, and then these are your chakras. So you would, you know, there are seven of them. Yeah. So you it's a system, to interpret that. system yeah. of seven. Yeah. But there's no commentary given with that. Right. I don't think so. So, but still, that sounds, and then, the, then the, it, brands, it goes here to the mouth of the turtle. Mm. You have to the mouth of the uh, the turtle. The mo- turtle is the mula bandha. Turtle is considered the uh, support of the universe. Exactly. And so uh, your pelvic floor, yeah, the perineum. And if you stand uh, in wet sand at the beach, yes, which I guess you can't do here, but and then if you there's a beach in the stream. Oh, okay. Stand there. Yeah, and this assumes that your feet are normal feet. Yes. Yeah, like no funny stuff. <laughs> and if you stand in samastiti here, your feet mm-hmm. together, and you, know, you mm-hmm. say your prayers, and then all of a sudden you just bounce up in the air and land, you know, like five or six feet away. Wow. The impression left in the sand looks like a turtle. Uh, because if the arches of your feet are formed well. I see. It's shaped like a little turtle shell. Uh-huh. This is my theory as to where how they came up with the turtle is the sport of I see. <laughs> and then the, then there's the seven snakes it looks like. Oh well, there's an infinite number of heads. Yeah. Oh it's not seven? Yeah, that's, that's Native American oh, yeah, as well. Yeah. The turtle is the support of the earth. It's also Native American. Yeah. And uh, not <laughs> so, okay. so then the one of the strands coming from the turtle's mouth yeah. goes through the chakras to Ganesha, and one comes to the mm-hmm. to the face of the yeah. Shesha. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, like the Kundalini type of thing. Yeah, same Shesha. Yeah. And so, w- what the one of the things that Shesha does, or Ananta Shesha, mm-hmm. is that it consumes residue, mm-hmm. like nectar, 
And so when Kundalini awakens, mm -hmm. then all that's left is really residue because the mind has stopped the reductive process. Uh -huh. And so what's left is basically the entire universe, which is shesha, or residue. Uh -huh. And then it's like tasting like a connoisseur, it is, it is actually nectar. The residue see. is the nectar of compassion. I see, yes. And so the, this is like the aesthetics of this experience. Drinking nectar for strong. Mm -hmm. And you could also flip it over because Ganesha is in the four petaled Patna, a lotus, which could be the pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. So yes, maybe it's doing it's a quite upright, you mean. And maybe they're doing a headstand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. Anyway, there are thousands of. The cool thing I love about these pictures and, and the mythology is that. Uh, you can just take off with it, you know, it's like, well, yeah, that means, and it just... What is the painting, actually? Is it, is I stole it from the internet. What? <laughs> <laughs> Did it say who painted it? No. So I don't think... It's a late it. painting, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pratyaksha. So, and you, why do you, so you put Pratyaksha so to... I just put it there, because I... What? I wanted to you be in the front of your face. Well, you know, Dignaga, there was there were these pramanas, right? And the Mimansakas had four pramanas. Yeah. And they had Pratyaksha, Anamana, and they had um, Upama, Upama, and, and, uh, and Shruti, I think. Yeah. Right? So that means scripture was a means of validation, validating cognition, and um, analogy was a means of validating cognition. And... Um, inference and direct experience, yeah. right? And uh, then Dignaga came and he said, actually there's only two, which are inference, because inference includes um, analogy and, uh, and authority. scripture and authority, yeah, yeah. and scripture. So, so really you don't need those other two as separate things, although they can be subdivided in parts of inference, conceptualizing things. And then he aligned the pratyaksha, the direct experience, with ultimate reality, paramartha sattva, ultimate reality. And he aligned all conceptualizing knowledge with sambhita sattva, superficial reality, an illusory reality. I mean, still reality, but illusory, right? Not what it seems, but something, right? And so then the goal becomes to, the same as you said, to free yourself from imposing your concept on your perception. And just seeing the inconceivability, meeting the inconceivability, and actually pure perception, pure experience, the boundary of subject and object is transcended all the time. So that there is actually a non-dual way of relating to even relative things. But it's only the, the conceptualization comes in in order to actually wall off the object and say that's an object outside of me and to define the subjectivity as separate from the object. So Dignaga, Dignaga pushed it to, the, that was early on already there, of course. And um, it was there in Buddha's own teaching, it was there in those doctrines that you mentioned. But Dignaga, in the context of the Nayayikas, you know, the, the Indian logicians, he elaborated that to where he really, Avyapadesha, I think, is one of his terms. You know, you, you are in touch with total reality when you have a direct sense experience or an inner mental yogic sense experience. But, you and it's completely real to you and you completely merge with that experience. But you can't describe it. It is not susceptible to coalescence with a word, is one of his expressions. Mm. It does not coalesce with a concept or a word. And the Nayayakas fought bitterly against that. He said, no, 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 because why? You see the floor, right? You look down here, you see this oak floor. And the, the word oak floor, the concept oak floor, the concept of floor seems to be simultaneously with your seeing this, you're having this visual thing. So, because we are normally completely unconscious about our habitual experience where the photon reflects, on one crude, one way, more subtle way of explaining, photon reflects off a surface, photon of light, that light, comes to the optic nerve, 
it's, a, it, it's like buzzes in the brain, rings a bell, ding, and then the brain comes up with a, a, a concept of a floor, oak floor, oh yeah, down there, you know, lower than my foot. And then ding links it up and then excludes all kind of extra buzzing which you will see when you're drunk or stoned. No. That's why when you're drunk or stoned, you can't tell if it's the floor or if it's, a, if it's the forest of dragons, right? Because, exactly. but then the hallucination is, why, when, why you hallucinate is because your mind is trying to, your conceptual mind is trying to regain traction where it's temporarily paralyzed by some noxious, some noxious substance, right? Uh, Alcohol, or, you know, uh, <laughs> but you know what it is, like they, they have a famous thing, the drunk goes out of the bar, it doesn't have to be like acid or something really juicy, yeah. it could be just the alcohol, <laughs> and the drunk goes out of the bar and he sees four moons in the sky, and he says, oh, there's the moon, he doesn't say there are the moons, yeah, he know. says there's the moon, so he then collapses the fact that he's actually seen four of them, it's so plastic. <laughs> So this is a big deal because what it means then is this is when this is non-duality. What it means then is our pure experience is the field of enlightenment to start with, always has been. But for some reason, actually the reason being avidya, you know, ignorance, or moha, uh, delusion, is uh, stupid to perfection, is like somehow created this separation where it's me versus the universe, which doesn't work well, right? Because uh, the universe is kind of out, out, out of me, right? It's a little bit, who's a little bit. Worse. What? Yeah, who's winning that one? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so the, but the beauty of the Pratyaksha is, in the, but the Nayayakas were, didn't like that non-duality. They were really upset. These are the Hindu magicians. And Dignaga, but Dignaga's name, you know, when Dignaga means, Dignaga means an elephant of directions. Yeah, big is, is which is, direction. Yeah, yeah. Well, which means of all directions. So it's a war yeah. elephant, actually. Yeah. So he was the war elephant of logic, of magician. No one could defeat him in logic. And, and but, but he used logic to bring the person out of the conceptual, the conceptual jungle of the magician who feels they're getting control over things by having names for them and having this and that, you know, the superficial kind of reasoning. You know, thinking where reason will control, which is what is afflicting uh, our scientific community, our natural scientific community. And they're really, you know, I said, did you see the thing that's being built in Japan? I saw it's 31 miles in diameter. It's a new smasher, you know. Huh? They're going to go beyond Higgs boson, which is only understood by inference. Nobody directly experienced Higgs boson. It's like the Higgs boson. They didn't, really, they didn't see it. They didn't see it. Just a bunch of stuff collided, and there was these explosions, and they had their standard model, and put up the standard model, and, oh yeah, that means that, ah, mass is there. But, uh, but we need a faster, bigger, 10 billion in Japan. They're tired of cappuccino. They want, like, sake. <laughs> Scientists were watching them. You know, they, they, they moved, they, they, there's a new big one in Europe, in Provence. They moved from Switzerland to Provence. They're getting hipper about their sense. So they want finer, finer food. Exactly. <laughs> so that's amazing that you picked out from the yeah. so and, and it's funny enough, the, the Shesha yeah. uh, is that when you try to take anything like any kind of rupa mm -hmm. like and then you put it into a category yes. a universal yes. um, that is only a contingent on temporary context dependence you know it's good to know that that's poor the kids are going to walk out of here but if you really look uh, what's actually there is spills over the edges of the category I and so it's like you're pouring reality into a tiny little idea uh -huh. and doesn't take long for you know what's actually happening to spill over the edges oh, sure. and that's what spills is called shesha uh, I guess sure the and then you make other categories to try to catch that residue yes and did then, I tell you about the poem with shesha and kumara <laughs> shan, you know the the, the kumara where it's a marvelous poem where it says may the 
may Shesha's happiness bless you. I think that Shesha's happiness bless you when he's feeling cold because, as usual, Uma defeated Shiva at strip dice poker. <laughs> and she, Shiva has to take off Shesha to come out of his hair. He has to clean off his ashes. And he has to like strip down all his things. Because she you know before she'll accept him. And so Shesha's feeling cold. And then and then uh, Kumara, you know, Shiva's son, the war god Kumara, Shandamukha Kumara, he says, Look, don't worry. You know, there's always this fire coming out of Shiva's third eye. So you just sort of go up near it and you just rub your hands together, you know, it's like two pumps. Two pumps around a garbage can and a fire. <laughs> Shiva's all ecstatic with Uma, right? See, they say you lost the game, so you know, then he gets his reward. So he took off his snake, and the snake is cold. So then the snake complains to her. He says, it's okay, just come near the fire of the third eye, and you won't notice, and you'll stay warm. So then Shesha feels comfortable, warm in the flame of the blazing flame coming out of the third eye. And so may the happiness of Shesha be to your blessing. <laughs> it's a four line, one of those caveats, you know, that beautiful poem. And I never quite connected it to this guy. It's, it's their beautiful, humorous thing. They complain about it, always oh, it's the Uma. Yeah, and takes off his things. You should uh, send mm -hmm. them to bed. What? You should send them off to bed. I think so, because they're yes. Getting, they're getting up early. Yes, everyone has been traveling, getting up early. Take your body of light. And I, oh yeah, let me tell you one thing. There's a special Menla med sleeping yoga where you, when you fall asleep, as you're falling asleep, before you fall asleep, you critique in your mind the state of being unconscious in darkness. Although you hope to reach that state, of course, to fall asleep, right? And you know, turn off the lights, close the door, put the blind, whatever. But critique in your mind that where you're resting during the night is a dark space, sort of like a simulation of nothingness, of oblivion. And remember the clear light of the void, what's called the clear light of the void, which is the fourth, the fourth level. You know, it's like the fourth state in Hindu you know, samadhis, you know, where you have waking, dream, and sleep, and then the fourth stage, right? So it's very similar to that. And it's beyond light and dark. It's a crystal trans. Clear light means clear, more than light. It's a light that has no shadow, because everything is transparent. So that light is that field of infinite energy, in other words. So the reason you're going to feel energized to rush off to Mysore Yoga in the morning is that your cells and your your you know your meat space atoms are like uh, letting go of themselves, and they're in this field of infinite energy. And any depletion in any of them is drawing, can draw inexhaustibly from that field of infinite energy. So just make a concept in your mind, like you know, like a self, self concept. Like I'm going to like go to sleep, and then I'll be unconscious in the dark. That's fine, but my body will not lie in nothingness, where which which can't get anything out of nothingness. You know, that's not going to get energized out of nothingness. And, uh, but my body will be actually, my mind will not be interfering with it, lying in its own true, real state, where it's made of bliss void and indivisible. Okay? That special menla sleep yoga. Mixing the clear light of sleep with the clear light of the dharmakaya, the body of reality of all Buddha. Okay? So you're going to really be ready to levitate in the morning. Okay? Good night. Thank you. Thank you.